Hey everybody. So some of you may remember that I did a video, maybe it's been like three, maybe four years. I don't think it's been quite that long yet where I talked about why most center channel speakers suck. And if you haven't watched that video, I definitely encourage you to watch it. But to sum it up, basically the issue that most center channel speakers have are that when you have woofers off to the side and then you just have a tweeter in the middle, there's a lot of cancellation in the mid-range frequencies that cause the listener to have like a dull sound through the upper mid-range. But most importantly is if you have a multi-seat home theater type setup, then the people who are sitting off to the side of the center channel are going to hear a vastly different sound than the person sitting right in the middle. And it's not even so much that the tonality is different. It's really that things like intelligibility, dialogue, clarity are affected majorly. And if you've been following the news over the last probably five or six years, one of the main concerns that audiences have is the inability to really tell what is being said on the screen. Mixes are recorded and dubbed very low. And so if you're like me, you may have resorted over to closed captioning. I'm just saying, and I don't think I'm going deaf, but it's really hard to tell what some of these people are saying on television. So when you buy a center channel speaker that is already compromised by the fact that the mix of the audio recording itself is going to sound pretty bad in terms of dialogue, and then that center channel adds its own lack of clarity, detail, and dialogue definition, then it's a real problem. So I made that video back then and I discussed all of this and I kind of gave you all a couple ideas of what to look for in a speaker. And one of those things was to look for a three-way design. And that way you have the tweeter and the mid-range separate from the woofers on the side. And that essentially will eliminate, for the most part, the comb filtering that you have. And the comb filtering is what causes the people off to the side to have pretty much no, it's not like it's completely gone away. So I don't want to make it hyperbolic, but it really changes the characteristics of the speaker that you're listening to, whether you're sitting in front of it or off to the side. Very different sounds, okay? Occasionally, I'll come across a center channel that kind of is the same thing, a two-way center channel, and it's like, yeah, there's nothing new here. I'll post the data to my website with a short few words, and I won't do a full video for it because it's like, what's the point? Now, enter the Paradigm 90C, which retails for about $28.99 a pair and was loaned to me by a viewer. This is a three-way design. It uses a coaxial mid-range and tweeter in the middle. It has two what they're considered seven-inch mid-bass drivers on the side and then two passive radiators as well. And it's a large center channel speaker, as you can see from this video. It's a good center channel should have at least, at least the majority of these, okay? Good output, at least if we're talking for a standard home theater room, multi-seat and things like that. Now, if you're talking for a smaller room, then we'll scale down the output. Okay, but good output, low distortion, high-ish sensitivity, because you don't want to have to throw a bunch of power at a speaker to get it to perform at higher output levels. Very good dynamic range. And, and again, the one of the most, if not the most crucial aspect, in my opinion, for a multi-seat home theater, very wide and even dispersion up to at least 20 degrees, if not out to 30 degrees to give you an extra little bit of headroom there. Being that this is a three-way design, I thought, well, this will be cool. This will be a, a really good option for somebody who wants to run a really nice home theater and they have the extra room because this is a large speaker. I got the speaker, I listened to it, and I was like, oh, this sounds pretty bad. Like, what's going on with the speaker? I was sitting dead in front of it. And then I moved over to the side and I was like, ooh, that's, that's still pretty bad. Like, even with closed captioning, it was, I was, it's just not good, right? Like, it was just skipped to the chaser. It's just not good. Now, the sensitivity was there. It didn't take a lot of power to drive the speaker. The bass was really nice. It actually got down to what I, most of the music that I was testing this out with before I switched over to home theater and used a center channel output was my typical music. And when I'm listening to music, I'm listening for the low end, at least. I'm listening for a nice, solid kick drum. And usually that's going to be in the 50 to 60 hertz region. If the speaker doesn't play that very well, then I know, all right, well, the speaker's not playing much below 50 or 60 hertz. The speaker didn't have that problem. It played down to 50 hertz in my room, not an issue. The, the problem again is just the sound. When you, the tone out, the upper mid range is missing. Like, I don't know how else to say it. Everything is very just, there's a lack of definition. There's a lack of clarity for music. There's, the attack is just gone. It's really a, 
it's kind of a lifeless sounding speaker, okay? And I'm gonna give you some sound clips in a little bit, and I'm gonna give you both directly on axis and also 30 degrees off axis, so you can kind of get an idea of what the change is as you move around the speaker. So for those of you who have a home theater, if you're sitting down in front of it, or if you have multi-seating and you have somebody sitting 30 degrees off the side. Now, usually based on some simple math and some questionnaires that I've posted to my audience, what I found is most people's home theater setups put the multi-seats, so the center seat and then the side seats within about zero degrees pointing right at the speaker or about 15 to 20 degrees off to the side. So when I get into the data, I'm gonna really focus on that a little bit more. So without spending a lot of time going over the oohs and ahs of the nice rhetoric and the stupid pros and all that flowery crap when we use to talk about speakers subjectively, let's just get to the data because I want you all to understand where I'm coming from. I've kind of given you an idea of what I heard and what I heard is not good, but let's just go ahead and kind of get through the data on this guy and then we'll make this a quick review and we'll take off. Now, first thing I want to do is we're going to do the sound clips, same as I always do before. It's going to be pink noise. Then it's going to be convolved with the on-axis response. And then this time it's going to be also convolved, convolved with the 30 degrees off-axis response. Okay, so let's do that. And now let's get on to the data. All of the data that you're about to see is captured using my Clipple Near Field Scanner. It takes the place of an anechoic chamber, which allows you to get anechoic data of a speaker without the room's influence. So we can know exactly what the speaker is going to do. And then we can use that data to better understand and better predict how it's going to behave in our rooms. And you can do this for all the different speakers that I reviewed. It's always the same baseline measurement set. And it's just a really good way to understand what you're about to buy. Now, for those of you who don't know, when I talk about on axis, I'm talking about pointing the speaker directly at your ear and off axis would be if you're moving your body away from the center of the speaker. This is the on axis frequency response sensitivity, roughly about 90 decibels. So that's a good thing. Uh, F3 is at 54 hertz down here and F10 is at 41 hertz. So this speaker should have no problem get down to about 50 hertz in most rooms. I put in the manufacturer's linearity expect at plus or minus two decibels from 55 hertz to 23 kilohertz. If you look at my measurement, you can see that response linearity is negative 9.5 and plus 3.45 decibels from 80 hertz to 16 kilohertz. If you ignore the tweeter response in the upper mid range, you're okay. Linearity down here through this region, it's pretty good. But when you get up to about 2K, it all goes to crap. And this is why I say that this seems to me like it's a very poor coaxial design. Now the CEA 2034 data set for the Founder 90C and the directivity down here is like, it's okay. It's not great, it's kind of choppy, but it's okay. But then you go down here to where this tweeter really is rolling in and you've got a pretty significant jump in directivity. Now, normally what you want is a linear directivity. If you have a linear directivity, I'm not saying it has to be flat, but line-ish, then that means that the on-axis behavior is replicated via the off-axis behavior, which is another way to say that the reflections are gonna sound similar to the direct sound that you're gonna hear. In other words, what I'm trying to say is this area right here cannot be fixed via equalization because you've got different things happening at different angles. Now, if we look at the estimated interim response, which is a good way to get the idea of the overall tonality of the speaker, and then I draw a line showing kind of how I heard it in my listening room, give credit where it's due. A nice bass bump, a nice thump, and extension to about 50 hertz, that's good, okay? I like that, that's cool, especially for a center channel to get down that low. But there's very, very poor mid-range and tweeter handoff. This is gonna sound, where this is gonna cause, I should say, the lack of definition, the lack of detail, even the lack of attack, the lack of clarity and dialogue, that's gonna be all through this region right there. This is all very problematic. And then the slope also indicates just the rate of the slope, you know, how steep it is. If it's really steep, then it's gonna sound like a darker speaker. If it's kind of flat, then it's gonna sound more like a brighter speaker in room. We got some ringing at about five to 6K and potentially some high frequency breakup around 20K. So now let's kind of evaluate what the speaker's doing as you're listening directly in front of the speaker versus off to the side. So this line right here represents zero degrees. So you're in line with the speaker right here. Okay, let's say maybe it's, we're looking at a bird's eye view 
And this is to the right of the listener, and this is to the left of the listener going out here. Now, we want to know how similar does the listener at 20 degrees, either side of us, hear the speaker compared to the person who's listening dead in front of the speaker, okay? So then we go out to about 20 degrees, and we kind of say, all right, here's a line through here. Okay, now they're going to hear a little bit of a dip in this region, and it's going to sound more of a little bit of a dip in this region. So there's your clarity and your dialogue. The other aspect to consider is that the further you go off axis, the more the sound changes via the reflections. So not only are they going to hear a different sound pointed directly at them, but the reflections are going to sound more and more different the further you go one way or the other. So if you go out this direction to the right of the listener, or if you go out this direction to the left of the listener, this guy sitting over here looking at the speaker down this way, and these people over here are hearing a different sound through this mid-range, but the response that's hitting the wall and coming back to their listening position is also going to sound different. What about vertically? So vertically, actually, this is pretty good. You've got about a plus or minus 40 degree window where you can sit in and have a pretty decent sound. But the problem really is that this tweeter comes in and just lights up. So this tweeter is a lot more hot, has a wider region. Now it's not, I'll be honest, in my opinion, this isn't really troublesome to me as long as you're within a reasonable range. So if you have multi-seating rows, right? then the person who's sitting on the front row, you don't want them to hear something vastly different than the person behind you. Like you don't want to have the, the only good spot in the room. You want the people behind you to hear something similar. And if they're sitting with that about 40 degrees, they're good. And for most multi-seated home theater setups or multi-row home theater setups, 40 degrees is more than good enough. In my old home theater, 20 degrees was typically the, the window that I needed to be within. Now let's talk about distortion and output capability. At 86 decibels at one meter, this is the distortion that you get. And then at 96 decibels. Now to me, for a speaker of this size, this is unacceptable. Why is this distortion so high when these woofers are supposed to be playing up to 500 Hertz? They're supposed to be seven inch woofers. They shouldn't be having that much trouble. <sighs> this just shouldn't be here. This right here should be down at closer to like negative 40 decibels. Okay, so this makes me think that the slope that's used here is just too shallow uh, for the mid-range. I'm thinking that this might be the mid-range issue through this region. I don't know because I didn't do near field measurements, but that's my guess. And this shouldn't be this way for a speaker of this size. Multi-tone distortion kind of shows us something similar. You've got higher mid-range distortion. Uh, it's not below or above really my personal 3.3% distortion threshold, but I wish it were better, again, given a speaker of its size. If you use a subwoofer, you don't really change it much, which indicates that the drivers they use are pretty good because they're not changing a lot with excursion. And now let's look at compression. This quick, dynamic, short-term, fast sound of compression. What do we get? This is not great. Again, speaker of this size should not have these kind of issues, okay? So this peaking of enhancement usually is due to distortion and then is followed by compression quickly in the mid-range. Uh, this speaker is going to have it should be better, right? I'm not saying it's the worst I've ever seen, but it should absolutely be better for a speaker of its size, especially having two seven inch woofers. And finally, we have the impedance plot. All right, so the nominal impedance is about four ohm. I'll just round up, four ohm, okay? If you're driving this with a class AB amplifier, this is gonna dip down to about 1.6 ohm. So it's gonna be current hungry for a class AB amplifier. So you may wanna need, or you may make sure you have a uh, proper amplifier that can go down to two ohm for this particular speaker, unless you decide to cross it over, let's say above like 80 to 100 Hertz. If you do that, then you're going to take the strain off the amplifier and you'll, you'll be okay or more okay. But overall, yeah, if you're using a class D probably be all right, but you may want a good, strong, powerful, current capable uh, class AB amplifier. And also I wanted to point out that there's some resonance in this 3.5 kilohertz region. My guess again, guesses, uh, is that this is a mid-range tweeter termination issue just based on the fact that the uh, the tweeter housing is probably not lined as well as it should be with the, we'll call it the mouth of the mid-range itself because that mid-range acts as a waveguide for that tweeter. So if there's not a, a good termination or a good handoff between that tweeter flange and then the mid-range as the waveguide, you're going to get some of these kind of effects, resonances, diffraction, things of that nature. So that does it for this review. I hope you appreciate it. And uh, you know, I don't like doing bad reviews. It's not fun. It really sucks, honestly. 
I want every speaker that I reviewed to really be impressive, not just in terms of subjective sound, but also objectively. Now, there can be no perfect speaker. I've said that many times, but at the price of $2,900 for this one center channel and its size, in my opinion, it should be a better performer. If you're upset with that, that's your prerogative. I'm just showing you the data. You have it. Make of it what you will. Uh, also, based on what I heard, it definitely needs some work. You know, it just sucks. It sucks not having having good things to say about a speaker. I tried. It's got good uh, vertical directivity. It's got a wide window and sensitivity is good. And it's a relatively easy to drive speaker in terms of sensitivity. But for an AB amp, you're going to need some current capability there. Yeah. All right. Well, if you enjoyed it, let me know in the comment section if you have any questions, all that good stuff. Please like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. That helps my channel out. And um, yeah, if you appreciate these kind of honest assessments, let me know because as much as I don't like doing them, I still share all the data on my website. Maybe I do shorts, but if you guys really appreciate seeing these, then I will be less hesitant to spend my time doing videos like this. And I want to make it clear. Other guys don't do negative views, reviews. I'm not that guy. I still post the data. I still do shorts. I still let you know, but I just don't know if it's worth me spending the time to create a video. And if you guys are going to watch it all the way through, as soon as you hear me say it sucks. Okay. So let me know in the comment section what you think. Um, you can support me via patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. Any of my generic affiliate links in the comment section below to anything. Amazon Crutchfield, I don't care what you buy. Buy it through those links. That helps me out a lot. And I really appreciate it, guys. And, oh, you could buy a shirt or something like that from the description below, too. Okay. I'm done talking. This sucks. All right. Talk to you later. Peace.